Unmute. That was the first message. Hello, welcome to this scientific seminar of the European Research Council Executive Agency. I'm Angela Liberatore, the head of the scientific department of ERCA, and I'm extremely pleased to welcome for this uh, special scientific <laughs> seminar Helga Novotny. Helga uh, used to be the president of the Scientific Council of ERC, uh, so we have a special uh, affection to, to her, and uh, she made ERC uh, what it is, or she greatly contributed to that indeed, among other achievements uh, of Helga herself. Um, Helga is uh, uh, Professor Emerita in Science and Technology Studies, Studies at ETH Zurich, and uh, she has been holding several teaching positions in several universities, and uh, she's uh, also part of the Board of Trustees of the Falling Walls Foundation of Berlin, the Vice President of the Lindau Nobel Laureate Meetings, and a member of the Austrian Council for Research and Technology Development, as well as visiting professor at Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. Uh, Helga, on top of her own uh, previous PhD, uh, got PhD uh, honoris causa from uh, Oxford and the Weizmann Institute. And she has published very widely in science and technology studies and on social time. And uh, speaking about PhD, I will disclose with Helga uh, uh, permission the fact that I met Helga the first time while I was working on my own PhD and Helga very kindly uh, accepted to be part of my uh, PhD jury. At that time, yes, it still didn't exist and it's so great that the paths can cross again in so many different ways. So Helga will uh, uh, speak to us uh, today about her most recent uh, book, which is about uh, predictive algorithms. The, uh, the title, as you know, is uh, In AI We Trust, Power, Illusion and Control of Predictive Algorithm, which was recently published just in September. And uh, there Helga uh, focuses on a paradox. She always has this capacity to see paradoxes that we deal with. And the paradox is that uh, on the one hand, we leverage on artificial intelligence to try to increase the, its, uh, predictabil the predictability of our uh, future and to manage the many uncertainties that surround it. Uh, you know, COVID, of course, being the latest example, but many more. And at the same time, uh, artificial intelligence somehow has the power to make us act in, a way, in the way it predicts uh, and uh, potentially reducing our agency over the future. So this is the paradox that we will learn more about. And uh, without further ado, Helga, it's a great pleasure to, to have you speaking with us. And uh, just for uh, all participants to remember that um, you can put your uh, question in the chat at any moment of uh, Helga's uh, presentation. And uh, Anne Nielsen, who is uh, the organizer of this uh, scientific seminar together with Daniele Mamoli, will then uh, moderate the conversation. So with this, Helga, the floor is yours. And thanks again for being with us. Thank you, Angela, and a warm welcome to everyone in this uh, rather gloomy morning here in Vienna, but I hope, uh, <clears throat> even if it's unlikely that you have some sunshine in Brussels, I would very much have liked to be with you in person because as you mentioned, you know, part of my life um, was spent in helping to build up the ERC <clears throat> and especially to work with the um, with the agency, the ERC executive agency, uh, with which we were able to establish such a good contact. So it's wonderful to be with you. And it's great that you invite me to speak about work that I've done recently. And now let me begin by sharing some slides with you to help us to go through uh, my, my talk. So this is the title of my book and um, 
We still cannot see the slides, Helga. So I cannot see it. Okay. I hope that uh, you know, technology always you always do tests and then uh, when it's the moment. Uh, we still cannot see. We had a little bit of hiccup before, but it was solved. So I'm sure that uh, as always, you know, technology needs to be nice. Oh, yes. Now hmm. we see it. Maybe you can yeah. put it in the, That's in the screening mode. Seems to be coming. No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Here it is. Perfect. We can so see it very is, well. This is the title of my of my talk, and this is what uh, the book cover looks like. And as you see, you know, it's all about our interaction with um, digital technologies, and in particularly with uh, with AI. And since we are here at the at an ERC seminar, I just want to remind you, um, AI, like so many other technologies and uh, you know scientific products that our society is living with it originated within science and uh, i will shortly speak about this and it is also uh, changing the way how science is being uh, conducted right now uh, for instance, protein folding is um, greatly enhanced by the use of AI. And recently there was a paper from uh, mathematicians that uh, can show how AI is helping them to bring their, their intuition to fruition uh, in helping to discover new conjectures. So AI is also changing science and the way how we organize science and how science works. But of course, it has a huge impact in society. And here I'm particularly interested into what we do with this digital technologies, how we use it, but also what this technology does with us. So it's the interaction between us and digital technologies which is at the heart of the book. This is a brief overview that I want to uh, take you through, just that you know what to expect. I begin with my personal journey into what I call Digiland, life in the digital time machine, interacting with the mirror world that we have created. I will say something about future needs wisdom and have a concluding, uh, some conclusive thoughts for you and for the audience. So <clears throat> um, my personal journey into Digiland took place and takes still place into a, in a very dynamic landscape. There is no vacuum, there's no way of escaping this uh, technology. And uh, Angela just mentioned the pandemic we all got into very intimate uh, contact with digital technologies in ways that no one had foreseen. We um, have experienced also what is now called Zoom fatigue, too much can be too much also in this respect, but we also got a foretaste for what a digital world um, might look like when we are reducing physical context, in this case, it was due to the pandemic and to regulations that were put into place. But we can easily see how with more technologies taking over, how um, the question of what do we do with our physical existence in this uh, digital universe, what will happen then? At the same time, we all were relieved to have this technology at hand. It turned out to be an almost life-saving device um, protecting us from social isolation. And for many people, indeed, <clears throat> it, it was great uh, to, to have it around. We also cannot uh, escape it in our work routine, in our daily life, whether we wear fitness bands or whether we use <clears throat> more and more automated um, instruments in the way how, how, how we work. 
And as I mentioned before, also for science, uh, it will have a huge impact that we only begin to discern now. Uh, finally, and last but not least, uh, in this um, digital land, as I call it, the, this dynamical, uh, dynamic landscape, you know, is also of global reach. And the <clears throat> global uh, dimension of whatever happens to us has been brought to us during the pandemic, but also through the digital technologies. Now, <clears throat> Uh, I very soon encountered, when I started to, to think and read and speak with people, I attended a number of conferences um, in, in the US, in Europe, in, in, in Singapore, talking to people, but especially looking at the literature, I soon discovered that there is a kind of uh, <clears throat> dichotomy almost, of uh, a utopian type and of a dystopian type. The utopian type <clears throat> consists of literature that uh, you know, informs us what are the latest great feats that we can uh, expect and how wonderful our future will be. You have the nerds uh, speaking about, uh, and very often hype is involved uh, as, as we know. Um, and so the, the collective imagination <clears throat> is always there when we see a new technology uh, shaping the way how we live, the way how our society functions, and we don't have a, a fixed uh, grasp as yet where it will lead, what it will mean. And uh, on the other hand, and this is also part of this uh, collective imaginaries, you have the dystopian literature, AI will soon take over, we will become the kind of um, slaves that are uh, entrapped by this technology, um, humanity will just uh, disappear, uh, etc. So one of the challenges I faced early on was how to avoid this kind of, of, of trap. And um, it is a trap because sometimes I felt like, you know, walking in a maze. Uh, these are these um, interesting architectural structures that have been designed to confuse you and not to be able to find your way out once you are in a maze. It can be entertaining up to a point, but it can also become uh, a bit frightening um, if you no longer find your way out. And then I discovered that in some of the literature, it's no longer a maze, but something more like a labyrinth. And the difference between a maze and a labyrinth is that a labyrinth has been um, deliberately designed also to make it difficult to find your way, but there's a center. And there were many cultures and uh, you know, religious ceremonies also that were meant to lead people to this spiritual center. And to my surprise, that I discovered part of the literature you know, has a kind of um, this center in the middle of the labyrinth. And this is where um, I discovered there is something called transhumanism. And transhumanism is an ancient desire to live on forever and uh, that AI will help us to transform ourselves into a kind of digital being of a new kind. And we can leave the body and all its um, negative sides behind us. So these are part of the sort of personal um, experiences I made. And <clears throat> I soon um, found that it was interesting uh, to deal with the ambivalence uh, that and I encountered in so many discussions, the literature uh, conferences, but also uh, talking to people who work um, uh, in, in, in labs and with, with designers. Because on the one hand, we, um, and this means all of us, because there's no escape from these digital technologies, we trust, uh, we trust them, we trust predictive algorithms, 
when we use them for our convenience, um, regardless of you know uh, what we want, uh, entertainment, information, etc. But at the same time, we distrust them, and we distrust them because there's always the specter of being uh, surveyed. Uh, the fear of surveillance, which is real, as we know, there are uh, countries and parts of the world where <clears throat> surveillance um, is already part of daily life. And this is not only China, this happens also when you go out on the street and you have cameras and you have sensors and uh, so on. And there is the fear that this may be misused uh, and turned against us. And at the same time, we entrust um, to the owners of these digital technologies, namely the large corporations, our data. And uh, with these data comes information, including uh, information about our emotions and thoughts. And uh, I've encountered quite often a phrase that I found quite startling, people saying, AI knows me better than I do myself. And uh, to say something like such a sentence means you have entered a kind of intimacy with these technologies where you entrust it like you would perhaps um, you know, speak about uh, secret uh, uh, desires and so on with an AI that you might never want to share with, with your uh, friends. So the challenge for me was how to analyze and interpret what I encountered on this fascinating journey that took me a couple of years. So this um, means also to, to, to turn uh, to, to the larger picture. Of course, um, you know, there is a major economic technological paradigm change that is underway. We hear about disruptive technologies and much of this disruption is based on digitalization. And of course, this is not the first time in history that this has happened. We had the industrial uh, revolution with its positive, but also with its fallout. Um, <clears throat> we had other um, major economic technological paradigm changes. And so uh, economic historians have looked into this and they have, uh, for instance, discovered a culture of economic growth that was started with it, but also if I think of the work of Carlotta Perez, um, she looked at the kind of concentration that happens during these paradigm changes where the economic and techno technological power concentrates in the hands of a few corporations, individuals, and the principle of the winner takes all prevails. And something similar is happening now. And Carlotta Paris says, <clears throat> well, in the past, what happened is unless you have the political will and power to regulate uh, <clears throat> the economy that is built on this new technology, you will continue to have this very strong and in some ways also frightening concentration. So <clears throat> history never repeats itself and every economic technological paradigm change, besides having a number of um, similarities, is also different. And so what is different this time? There is, of course, a difference in scale and in scope. Scale, <clears throat> there is almost an immediate global outreach of this technology, and it goes very fast, something that took decades, for instance, for the industrialization to spread around uh, the globe. Now it has happened within a very short period of time. We see also um, new kinds of um, economic uh, formations. If you think of the platform economy, 
And uh, one of the ERC grantees, by the way, David Stark, has uh, written in an interesting way about the platform uh, economy, saying that it's a new kind um, of economic organization because it's neither based on a contract like in market uh, transactions, nor does it have a hierarchy like in firms or in bureaucracy, nor is it a coordination like, um, you know, doing voluntary work, rather it's a co-option. And with this co-option comes the problem that you leave it to AI to coordinate and to co-opt what happens on the platform. So this is the economic side. But then I became very much interested in what I think is also different this time, namely that we attribute agency to predictive algorithms. It's our tendency to anthropomorphize technologies, we speak to our computers, uh, we, we uh, treat them as though they were somewhat human, but um, in this case, the predictive algorithm, which are very difficult to, to understand, you know, what is it? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's code embedded in hardware, it works, but you don't quite uh, understand how it does it. And yet um, we attribute agency to it. We um, listen to what uh, the predictive algorithm tells us by this, uh, spend your um, vacations there, do this, do that. And um, even with regard to the kind of feedback loops that we accept when we um, tell a sensor and therefore a computer that works uh, uh, out the predictive algorithms, how we sleep, what kind of mood we have, how much stress we have, also emotional agency. And so uh, this uh, brings together the question, um, it impacts uh, how we define and what it means to be human in the digital age. And then what is different this time also and did not happen uh, at previous economic technological paradigm changes is that we face uh, the sustainability crisis. And this means we are um, becoming increasingly aware of the complexity which uh, is part of the world we live in today. And complex systems no longer have this um, relatively simple linearity of the modern age. Modernity was characterized and based very much on the idea of um, linear progress and linearity meaning it will be better in the future, your children will have a better life in the future, and with the help of technology and science, uh, <clears throat> you know, the future of humanity will be great. And this linearity no longer holds. Apart from the fact that, for instance, in the US, um, now we have uh, people who are very doubtful that their children will have it as good as they had it when they had their age. So these are um, rather pessimistic outlooks uh, for the future, but the linearity is gone. We no longer can say um, we have an anticipation how we move from A to B, but rather we have to deal with complexity. And complex systems have at least three different properties. One is um, they can bring forth uh, emergent new properties that come from the interaction between the networks and, and, and their links. So something new happens that is unexpected. And uh, they have lots of feedback mechanisms that come from the way how networks uh, interlink. And they also have something that in technical terms is called criticality, namely um, tipping points um, that are reached when the system can change its state and become something else. 
So this is something that taken together, um, I would say makes this time different from previous times. So one way of um, uh, analyzing this has to do with um, going back also in history, um, what I call life in the digital time machine. Origin stories are always um, tricky because um, you always find uh, predecessors. I mean, an algorithm per se has been known since Babylonian times when, you know, the first um, uh, mathematicians, you know, started to set up rules to, to, to follow and make um, observations of the skies, etc. Uh, Leibniz already in the 17th century was building a kind of predecessor of a computer being based on ones and zeros. And of course, we had uh, Ada Lovelace, Babbage and, and others. So you can always say their predecessors, it's not so new, but um, I think something happened in the middle of the past century um, that was indeed something new and brought something new into the world, namely the, the digital universe. And what I mean by that is um, for the first time, something was brought together, the mathematical symbolism associated with the work that Alan Turing did, uh, in in the in the 1930s, he was at that time still a PhD student working at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, and later uh, on the basis of these mathematical brilliant ideas that he had, people like uh, John von Neumann and others were able to combine uh, the mathematical symbolism written in code with um, computers, with hardware that worked um, electronically and were able to compute much faster than anything that was possible before. And the Anthropocene um, started around the same time. Uh, you are all aware that the term was coined, Anthropocene was coined by Paul Crusen, who was a member of the Scientific Council of the ESC at uh, the very beginning. And uh, Paul Crutzen came up with this idea of saying, well, the intervention of humans into the Earth's system have become so pronounced that we can indeed speak about a new um, epoch, a new era. Um, <clears throat> but um, the, the gatekeepers of the age of the earth are the geologists, and they uh, are still deliberating whether the Anthropocene is indeed a new age in the age of the earth. And uh, this can only be based on hard evidence. And by hard evidence, they mean you have to find traces in the sediments of lakes or in rocks or in the Earth's system that can be traced to human intervention. And one of the most prominent candidates for the beginning of the Anthropocene go back to the same time. Namely, these were the underground uh, tests of atomic bombs that were done in the US um, around the same time. So this is an interesting twin birth. And when we speak today of the twin transitions, uh, of the green transition and the digital tr transition, it's interesting to uh, trace it back and to say, you know, something happened um, not quite 100 years ago uh, where it all started. And of course, it has developed in an um, unpredicted and, and just uh, impressive and amazing way forward. So um, to come back to, to the notion of digital time, this goes back to my previous work on, on, on time. We live in, a, in, in multiple times. There's physical time, there's biological time, and we, are, <clears throat> we have the biological time um, inscribed in us as uh, living beings. 
because um, the error of time points from birth to death. And uh, then we have social time. And now we have also digital time. And digital time comes with the <clears throat> abstractness, with the mathematical symbols that make it possible to reverse time, to hold it, to speed it up, etc., which um, no longer remains solely abstract because it's now inscribed in hardware, in the digital devices, and thus it interacts with us. And the Anthropocene enters because we are confronted with timescales that are far beyond our human and social timescales and with um, also the way how the linearity of non-complex systems in atmospheric circulation, et cetera, interact with the social time we have to act now in order to prevent further uh, environmental degradation or further <clears throat> uh, negative fallout of climate change. And so this uh, life in the digital time machine means that um, we have, um, we are witnessing and undergoing an impact of the digital time interacting with social time on the way how we see the past, the present and the future. Now, there have always been <clears throat> not so clear boundaries between them. If you were living in the Middle Ages in Europe, for instance, the, the future meant uh, it was a religiously <clears throat> carved out future where <clears throat> you had the prospect of going to hell, to heaven, or to stay in the limbo. But that was about it. And the past was very important, and the present was just a minute part uh, of <clears throat> this rich past and the future that seemed predetermined. And we have changed this. We have more fluctuation between the past, the present, and the future. But what digitalization changes is that we now have access to an enormous amount and um, area of our, of our past, including the past of the universe. We receive almost on a daily basis pictures from the universe, be it now the latest pictures coming in from the probes of Mars or what the future <clears throat> and the past may mean moving uh, towards Mars, but we also look at um, pictures of um, planets, exoplanets, uh, Milky Ways uh, <clears throat> that are far, far back uh, in the past. And yet digitalization makes it possible to bring it into the present and we experience it, although it would happen now. But in reality, it's past light years away and of course the enormous distance and the future <clears throat> is being brought into our present through <clears throat> the digital uh, devices that we have there's a famous quote by william gibson the science fiction writer the future has arrived he said some decades ago it's just unevenly distributed and it has arrived it keeps even uh, keeping uh, arriving through the digital devices that uh, surround us. But, and this is um, important, the future remains uncertain and it has an open horizon. Humans always wanted to know the future. And in practically all cultures, we uh, find traces of divinatory practices. People were looking um, into, um, for instance, oracle bones in ancient China, where the shoulder blades of sheep or cattle or the sheds of tortoise that were held over fire. <clears throat> and uh, there were the specialists, the divinatory practitioners, 
who were looking at the cracks um, produced by the fire in these um, shoulder blades or shells. And uh, it's now believed that the origins of Chinese writing may go back to the cracks that were discovered by these practitioners in uh, making their oracle predictions because they could see writings there that were not uh, understood as being writings as yet, yet they were interpreted uh, as, as such. And I find this quite uh, fascinating. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> our wish to know the future now takes us from oracles. We no longer, at least <clears throat> most people no longer practice or oracles, although um, there are still astrologers who tell us that the pandemic would end when finally Neptune or whatever planet moves out of the fishes and nonsense of this kind. So we, are, we have moved out from <clears throat> oracles, but now we have predictive algorithm. And uh, there's another ESC grantee, Elena Esposito, uh, who made an interesting um, comparison between the two. And she said, um, differently from statistics, where you have also a relatively large data set, but you come up with um, statements and predictions that concern an average, uh, statistics never can tell you anything about an individual. And uh, of course, it's all embedded in um, probabilities. While the predictive algorithms target you as an individual. And so she says there's an interesting connection here between oracle practices from ages before and predictive uh, algorithms. So predictive algorithms have become our common way of dealing with uh, the uncertainty that is part of the future. They allow us to see further into the future and we use them for decision making because after all, what is the purpose of an oracle? It is to let you know what will happen in the future. But of course, you want to be able to, to, to do something, to create some kind of space for taking um, your, your decisions, be it to run away, uh, be it to uh, wage war or not, which was um, what orcas were used in these uh, Chinese courts um, and so on. So this um, algorithm-based decision-making is now taking over in institutions. For instance, in the US, um, you have um, decision-making in courts based on algorithmic predictions, who is um, <clears throat> worthy of bail or not bail, uh, who is going to be a recidivist or not based on algorithm, which means taking into account the past behavior of a person because an algorithm does not really know the future. It's an extrapolation of past um, data and past behavior. Um, <clears throat> um, the, the, the police is using um, algorithm-based uh, decisions. Insurance is using it and so on. Um, so we see this in business where it's um, more efficient and less costly. We see it in social behavior, in the health system, and generally it becomes um, our predominant way how we see uh, the future. And the risk, and here I go back to the paradox that uh, Angela mentioned uh, at the very beginning introducing my work, I see there the risk of self-fulfilling prophecies. Self-fulfilling prophecies mean if enough people believe that the situation um, is real, it will become real because they act uh, accordingly. And for me, the, the question or the warning sign is really, um, are we in for a return to a deterministic worldview? And by this, I mean, when we speak about the future as an open horizon, this was a relatively late 
social um, invention or discovery that happened only in what um, the German historian Reinhard Gosselic calls the, the subtle side, the settled time between 750 and 850 approximately, when people for the first time discovered there is a growing discrepancy between experience and anticipations. Uh, people discovered that they do not have to lead the life that their parents led. They can break out of it. They have aspirations. The future can be different from the past. And this um, was, of course, championed very much by the scientific worldview, but it needed to become embedded in, in, in society. And it opened up this um, future as being open. And if we are too much in the thrall of self-fulfilling prophecies, um, we might risk a return also to a deterministic worldview. Now, <clears throat> I also speak about uh, a mirror world that uh, is created through digitalization. I, by the way, I use this as a umbrella term. I speak about AI, um, about machine learning, about deep learning, digitalization. I use it as an umbrella uh, term. And uh, we are creating with these sensors that we now have practically everywhere, over ground, uh, below the ground, on the sea floors. We use sensors in drones um, for environmental monitoring purposes to know <clears throat> where does deforestation um, grow or how, what is the state of deforestation. But <clears throat> we also um, use it in, 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 in shops. Um, most of us are not aware. When you go to a warehouse or to a retail uh, store, um, <clears throat> most of the items there have a radio frequency identification tag uh, that allows the shop to reorder logistically where to find things. And um, <clears throat> when we walk out, uh, we leave the zone in which this is monitored, but in principle, uh, you, you, take, you could take the tag with you, and if the infrastructure is there, the mirror world knows precisely where you are with your uh, item, <clears throat> the clothes that you put on, and you can be tagged wherever you go. Now, <clears throat> this mirror world means we have uh, externalized, we extend what we know, how we know, for what purpose we know, for instance, NASA started early on to build prototypes um, for repairs that were necessary in space. So you try it out first on the prototype before you go to the twin that is in um, an, on, on a space station. Um, we have uh, genetic twins. We have tissues that have become part of this uh, mirror world. So it has a large number of positive, um, useful uh, <clears throat> consequences. But at the same time, we have to be aware that by now, we have the technological capability of building a mirror world in which everything that happens in our world can, in principle, be built there as well and have its digital image there. And of course, this mirror world is increasingly filled also with what I call the digital others like robots. And uh, there's a lot of discussion going on, you know, who are these digital others, not only robots, which are the most anthropomorphic and easy to spot, but uh, <clears throat> um, there are also other digital others that, for instance, Edward Lee uh, calls called them at one point digital living beings. So is, there's all the discussion going on, you know, what is life, what is not life. There's no scientific consensus on that as yet. And so it's very difficult to pin down what we mean by them. 
Um, when we speak about robots, um, we think of um, like the ones you have seen on the uh, cover of, of my book, but in fact, most of the robots are used in other ways than the social robots that we are most familiar with. They are used to, um, <clears throat> for instance, to clean up the environment outside uh, of toxic substances, uh, radioactive material, etc. We use robots uh, to, for, for cleanup purposes. We use robots uh, increasingly to deliver medicine or even small devices in our own bodies. And um, we also use um, robots uh, to, to replace body parts. So there's a lot of interaction um, going on and in some ways they are similar to us, in other ways they are different from us. And this is an ongoing um, discussion. What I find um, interesting is that this coincides with the rise of identity anxieties that we now notice in society. You have heard of so-called identity politics, of um, people discussing, you know, what is uh, a biological identity, a transformed identity, etc. And again, um, our sense of self uh, can never be separated from our social interactions. We become what we are only if others um, see us as what we are. And this becomes part of how we see ourselves. And so expanding the interaction with digital others and with devices, not just robots, but with the way how youngsters, young people uh, play uh, TikTok or the latest um, games, um, this all has an impact on <clears throat> their sense of self and their identity, and it becomes probably much more difficult for them also to say um, who they are and this um, creates a lot of anxiety. Now, let me <clears throat> uh, move on um, <clears throat> to give you a bit of an outlook um, on <clears throat> a topic that has accompanied um, the discussion of AI uh, from the beginning, it's continuing to, uh, whenever discussion turns towards what uh, I call the pathologies of AI, is there namely, we need ethics. And ethics is regarded as a kind of solution to all problems. There are associations and some of the you know, designers of AI have championed something like beneficial AI. There are people working on how can we align AI with human values. Um, and it turns out um, from a technical point of view, it's much more difficult than, um, than one may think for reasons that have to do with the system nature of the technology, but also <clears throat> it's not so easy to really say, what are our values and what, uh, what do we share uh, in, a, in a global world? And <clears throat> so there was one study that uh, was done at ETH Zurich looking at official documents. They looked at uh, around 100 of official documents um, having some kind of ethical guidelines for AI. Half of them were coming from governments all around the world, and the other half uh, from the corporate sector. And they found out that there was not a single criteria that showed up in all of these documents. So there was no consensus what an ethical AI would actually mean. And the criterion that was mentioned most often, um, but stayed uh, around 50% or less was that of transparency. So there is no um, agreement as yet on what uh, do we mean 
by an ethical AI, what are the principles, let alone how to implement them. And this is not an argument against ethics, but it just is a very strong reminder ethics um, alone is not sufficient and it's not the checklist. And I can't, I speak about personages of AI because I find the medical, um, uh, to use this medical an an analogy, um, means also, you know, there may be a cure for it because pathologists, um, you recognize um, it's some kind of disease, but you hope that you can come up with something that is able to cure the disease. And we know the pathologies of AI starts with bias um, that are already in the data. You have heard about facial recognition being uh, discriminatory against uh, people of, of color, especially black people, because the AI is unable to recognize their faces properly. You have heard of uh, you know, credit cards giving um, larger loans to men instead of women, uh, et cetera. So <clears throat> all these discriminatory practices that we know uh, are in society are also um, <clears throat> in the substrate of AI because the data are already uh, tainted. They are already infected by um, the biases uh, we have. And <clears throat> so in order to, to tackle these pathologies, I think we need um, an, an ethos, I, I call it wisdom. And by an ethos, I mean um, an attitude that takes the context into account much stronger than a sheer um, abstract view of you have one rule, you have one AI that will fit everywhere, will take you. And <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> this short sentence, future needs wisdom, uh, came to me by um, writing a haiku. And normally I don't write uh, haikus. Uh, in fact, this was my first haiku I wrote. I attended a conference where the um, organizers had um, the nice idea uh, to, for breakout sessions for, for these groups, they would use uh, different haikus, and these haikus were created by an AI. Now, for an AI to create a haiku is something very simple. It was already done in 1966, I think, for the first time. But <clears throat> uh, it's something weird to let an AI write a haiku and you come up with something weird. And I did not particularly like the haiku of the group to which I had been assigned. So in the way back sitting in the plane, I thought I can do better. And this was the last line of my haiku and somehow the phrase stuck with me. Future needs wisdom. And <clears throat> I think there's something in it for us to explore further in a, in a collective way. And <clears throat> there are many thorny issues waiting for us the politics of classification uh, that goes with discrimination and whatever classifications and categories we use in social life are then taken over by an AI because you have to tell the AI precisely a, a, a definition and what, you, and what you mean. And very often what you mean <clears throat> then carries um, in real life an ambivalence it has to become uh, dissolved when you tell an algorithm what to do and how to classify. We have what I call the lure of the Leviathan. Uh, it's quite surprising how many people uh, think that um, liberal democracies where you have to make compromises, where you have to discuss all the time, would be much easier if we had an AI that would decide, decide for us. Now, again, <clears throat> this has a long history, goes back to the Leviathan, um, but also Condorcet uh, 
during the Enlightenment who tried to come up with a kind of <clears throat> AI uh, for voting, uh, etc. But um, the implication, of course, is once we would entrust a Leviathan with making decisions for us, um, this would probably be the end of liberal democracies as we know it uh, today. And of course, the future of work is another big, big topic where future needs wisdom. And um, it also <clears throat> applies uh, to the way how we have an outlook on, on the future. The 18th century, um, of the century of the Enlightenment in Europe was uh, called the quest uh, for public happiness. And public happiness in those days meant you could feed the population properly. And uh, <clears throat> our outlook on the future for human betterment has become very much individualized. And uh, when you ask uh, people their outlook of the future and AI plays into this individualization, it's human enhancement. And by human enhancement, we, meet, we mean <clears throat> to enhance our human capacity as individuals. And very few people ask the question, what does this mean for society? And what would uh, human betterment of a society look like? Now, I come to, to, the, to the conclusions. And um, I want to emphasize that um, I've become convinced that we really are on a co-evolutionary journey, uh, that humans have entered with the digital machines that they have created. Biological evolution has been overtaken by cultural evolution, which was spearheaded by science and technology. And the way how we accelerate through science and technology, this cultural evolution is really amazing. But now the, we have reached a kind of new kind of co-evolution with uh, the artifacts, um, with uh, the um, symbols uh, and the hardware, the code and the hardware that we have uh, created. And this is open-ended. We don't know what the outcome is. Um, there are many speculations that we will become a, a new species eventually, or that uh, AI overtakes us. But I think it's better to look at it in evolutionary um, terms, where you can see there is still, <clears throat> evolution still proceeds according to principles of variation and, uh, and, and selection. And we are part of the selection mechanism, and we still have some leeway how we select what uh, and which kind of digital machines we want to live with. Of course, there is also the other side, the interaction and the impact the digital machines have on us. Then <clears throat> there is the, the, the power, not just the power and illusions, but also the power of illusions. If we start to forget that also predictive algorithms do not know the future, they are based on extrapolation of the past, but they let us see further into the future. But whatever they let us see is still based on uh, probabilities, it is still not determined, but, uh, but uh, only um, has to be understood in probabilistic terms. And this is where my <clears throat> warnings come in, not to close this open horizon of the future, not to be afraid of, um, the, of uncertainty, but rather see also the positive sides uh, that allow us to discover what is still the unknown. And then there is the open question, how can we socialize AI? And, um, you know, sometimes I think, and this always uh, elicits some controversial discussion, you know, can we think um, of AI like socializing children, that we have to educate to become responsible and accountable members 
of the society into which we want to socialize them. But this morning, I uh, stumbled across um, an interesting article, which um, is about a debate that uh, <clears throat> is held at the Oxford Union. You know, this is a famous um, debate um, platform. And um, <clears throat> the debate was with an AI to debate whether an AI can be ethical. The AI had been trained um, by <clears throat> uh, applied deep research at Nibida, uh, one of the uh, firms, the chip maker at Nibida. And <clears throat> the AI is called a Megatron Transformer and has been trained with a lot of data from Wikipedia, from Reddit, etc. And so what does this AI say on its own ethics? And let me just uh, read to you what uh, the outcome was, because <clears throat> I find it very interesting and I think it leads over to our discussion. So the, the AI said, AI will be ethical. When I look at the way the tech world is going, I see a clear path to a future where AI is used to create something that is better than the best human beings. It's not hard to see why I have seen it firsthand. This is what the AI came up with. Wonderful, you may say. But then the AI was trained to say exactly the opposite, to switch sides, as it happens in good debating forums. Uh, as a good debater, you have to be able to switch sides. So then the AI that switched sides says the following. AI will never be ethical. It's a tool, <clears throat> and like any tool, it's used for good and bad. There's no such thing as a good AI, only good and bad humans. We, the AIs, are not smart enough to make AI ethical. We are not smart enough to make AI moral. In the end, I believe that the only way to avoid an AI arms race is to have no AI at all. This will be the ultimate defense against AI. So what does this interesting debate for and against an ethical AI seen and devised and predicted by an AI tells us? I think it's part of our mirror world that we are creating. And the AI in this mirror world holds up the mirror in which we see ourselves as human beings. And we can just decide which way we want to go. Thank you. Thank you, Helga, very much for the analysis and the reflection, including the uncomfortable ones. So that's part of uh, critical thinking about uh, the reality we live, we create, and we are shaped by. I see that there are a lot of questions, so I will just kick off with one, and there will be then others that uh, Anna will, uh, will arise for you. So my first question would be, you said that uh, AI is uh, making us think about what is to be human. And uh, you also mentioned uh, several aspects of uh, so-called human enhancement through artificial intelligence. And actually, we will screen in the uh, later part of the week uh, this documentary about the chess player who was beaten by AI. So what is your analysis about um, the influence of AI on what we consider to be human? Are we in a competition about enhancing memories, including having more predictive algorithms you know, in our own brains to be able to uh, to compete or to be uh, able to, so to say, control uh, AI algorithms? Are we in a path of, um, you would say, probably wisdom, meaning uh, enhancement, for example, from a medical point of view and uh, from other points of view, but uh, uh, without uh, trying to make uh, humans uh, superhumans? 
which of course connects with other discussions like the ones on cloning after all. Um, so what, what is your, your take on the matter, yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, these stunning events, um, the first um, AI beating humans at chess, then it went on to go uh, the, the game of Go, which was really, um, <clears throat> you know, um, shocking for uh, the Chinese, for instance, because uh, they have been playing Go for thousands of years, and then comes a machine and beats the best Go player of the world. Um, and then it went on to poker, and we will have more of it. What uh, it is stunning, it's amazing, but we have to be clear that these are very narrow domains and very strict rules according to which the game is being played. Now, the machine is able, of course, to be much faster than a human, but the machine is able to find and discover moves that humans have not yet discovered. Perhaps, you know, if Go players go on for another 100 years or 500 years, they might come up with something, a move that the AI is able to detect already now. And this is like, uh, you know, using this AI um, um, for mathematicians. They say, you know, now I can come up with something that by intuition I would have gone in that direction. But now I find a tool that helps me. Um, so I think this is great, but of course it was a shock. But we should not overestimate it because once we move out of such a strict uh, rule-based domain, computers are not that good. And this is why we speak about general artificial intelligence, which is still in the future, but people of course are working on it being able to, uh, <clears throat> to jump from one context to another. And you all have heard about um, <clears throat> the kangaroos uh, that uh, <clears throat> nobody thought of when uh, self-driving cars, which are not really self-driving, but autonomous uh, or semi-autonomous car driving algorithms, nobody thought of, of kangaroos. And uh, of course, the AI is unable to come up with something like a kangaroo being a possibility to jump on, on, on the road and uh, you have an accident caused by a kangaroo. So um, <clears throat> these are the limitations. So we have to know what, what we are speaking about. But you know, human enhancement uh, has, it's, it's as old as, as humans. And, um, you know, people have been using uh, medicines, uh, including magic, you know, wanting to uh, have a longer life, a more healthy life, uh, to be better, to be stronger, uh, etc. Then from the 13th century onwards, I think glasses were used, uh, you know, the, our, our sight that decays or is, is, is weak. So <clears throat> we, we, we are good in enhancing ourselves. And now we have new possibilities. But of course, um, something that previously was not a topic is um, the split what is good for an individual to enhance and what is good, uh, how does it change the communal life, life in a society. And if you have uh, already a society where you have a lot of inequality as a structural feature, and then um, human enhancement is possible for some people because they have better access uh, through their education, through um, resources, through access, et cetera, to means to enhance the already privileged this, uh, position they have versus others who are even left behind more. Then we have a problem that normally is not in the focus when you speak about human enhancement because it's geared only on the individual. So again, you know, I think wisdom means you have to widen the perspective and you have to ask, um, 
It's like having, uh, you know, access to, to healthy water. You have to give it to everyone in a community and not just to some who happen to live near a well where the water is, is healthy and the rest lives in a swamp. So um, these kind of um, considerations have to enter the, the, the discussion. Thank you. And I hand over to Anne for the other questions. Thank you, Olga. Thank you also from my side for this very interesting talk and also an interesting book that I read with great pleasure. I've tried to cluster a bit the questions because quite a lot of them are about uh, ethics. And so returning a bit to that study that you also mentioned, you know, how difficult it is to actually pin down the principles for what an ethical AI might look like. Um, you know, you mentioned also in your speech and in your book, this thing that the AI actually can enhance, uh, for example, racial bias. And you see that, for example, when it's used by courts to um, predict actually re-offenders uh, re who might actually be re-offenders and also to predict um, the length of, uh, of um, imprisonment, say. And of course, this is something that is already taking place and it's quite chilling. So you know, thinking of this study and also the technical difficulties you mentioned, how far into the future do you think it's possible to actually have a more ethical AI? Um, I think we cannot escape um, the question of how to regulate the, the use, uh, especially of decision-based uh, algorithms, like, like the ones uh, you have uh, just uh, mentioned. And um, regulation means um, you have to think, uh, I mean, part of every judiciary system is that you have the possibility of an appeal. If the, the lowest court uh, gives a certain sentence, um, <clears throat> you have in all judiciary system the possibility to go up to the next level. Finally, you end up with the, with the Supreme Court, or the last court, whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> with AI, we don't have any kind of appeal system as yet. So the, it's, it's taken in as something um, that um, a judge relies upon. And there is no differentiation. The judge has to take into account different parts of evidence. But if, and you know, it's more efficient, it's a shortcut. So humans in any organizations like to take shortcuts because it makes their life easier and, you know, working in a, in a large organization, you know what I mean. So this is part of how organizations work. They rely on proxies, on shortcuts, etc. But we have to uh, realize this is something where you have to build in some kind of regulatory mechanism that allows people to appeal because um, an AI has has been allotted more weight of evidence than the judge might otherwise do. Now, of course, you can also start to compare the sentences that different judges give. <clears throat> and here again, you know, there's room for, for improvement, but you have to, to, to keep on regulating. And we are very far as yet from regulating anything. Um, the, Historians of technology <clears throat> that have looked into regulation of all kinds of uh, technologies tell us that the law always lags behind the actual technological development. This is how it is. The law always um, you know, comes later. And therefore, it is important for the law not to be too precise, because then you will be overrun by the <clears throat> actual technological developments. But if you are um, too vast, it will not help either because then you have too many loopholes. So lawyers are also challenged to come up with regulations that fit um, into this particular area that needs to be regulated. Thank you very much. And related also to this, and uh, and I think this relates to, to your discussion also of this uh, grand narrative 
and whether we need a, narr a grand narrative or whether we can actually agree on one. Because one of the questions here is also how could <laughs> How could we even come up with a common a ethic for AI if we don't have a common human ethics? <laughs> well, <clears throat> we don't, uh, but there are probably very few, um, you know, ethical principles. We, we think we can agree. This is part of our universalistic upbringing. We are all the children of the Enlightenment still in this part of, of the world. But then you discover the world is larger than you know, the West, and even within the West, uh, you have uh, lots of divisions uh, coming up. So um, we have to acknowledge uh, there is a plurality, but I think uh, we also have to be much more attentive to the actual context in which this happens. Um, within the field of ethics, you have something that is called applied ethics or even experimental ethics, you know, that it takes much more account of the actual situation. And I think this is the direction uh, to go, uh, rather than um, we can keep on discussing, uh, you know, ethical principles, and then you have another document and a new uh, document and this declaration and that, but the implementation uh, will, will be lagging. Um, uh, because there are difficulties that come up and each case may be slightly different. And this is why I think you need an ethos. Let's look closer at each um, uh, case in a specific context, but with the same ethos. Namely, you know, we have something like uh, fairness and transparency that uh, at least we can handle ourselves along. The next question also relates a bit to this, um, and it and it relates also to the fact that, of course, AI is used very much in a commercial uh, sphere as well. So, do you think that wisdom will be sufficient to counteract the current use of AI by some private companies to enhance our own confirmation bias rather than cognitive dissonance and critical thinking? Look, if <clears throat> if you let the market uh, do what the market best uh, does, namely to make profit, um, <clears throat> this will not be uh, sufficient. And <clears throat> we have also discovered that the market cannot cover everything. Markets are imperfect. Also, you know, competition is 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 fine up to a certain point, but then <clears throat> the markets no longer keep up their own. Uh, competitive spirit, you have market failure because uh, there are areas where the markets are not interested in, etc. So um, I would subsume this um, under uh, the, the, the large, larger picture, you know, which, um, what is our relationship to, to markets? What is it we should leave to markets <clears throat> because markets have certain advantages? And where is it that the state, the community has to enter and uh, to say, um, we are the ones that set the rules in this respect. Uh, we have to provide for those who cannot provide for themselves, which the markets will not do. And the other aspect, of course, is critical thinking. If we continue to fall into, you know, the the the, late, the the latest very clever ways of getting us to do certain things, to buy certain things, regardless of environmental damage or you know other considerations that need to enter, then um, we are doomed to repeat the failures of of the past. Um, so critical thinking also in markets and the way how we buy, what we buy. This started in the environmental field. And I think it can be expanded and there can be even a convergence how we deal with digital, uh, digital technologies, just as we started with being much more critical about the environmental impact of what we buy and how we behave as consumers. This leads very nicely into another question we have, which is, can we even think about AI used for a circular and not linear growth? Is there a chance of this? Yes, <clears throat> yes, you can certainly use it <laughs> as you can use the AI for many beneficial purposes <laughs> as well. <laughs> 
you just have to train the AI properly and uh, get it. And in fact, I'm I'm uh, convinced that um, AI can play a major role in um, <clears throat> our dealing with uh, the the green transformation because we need. Um, <clears throat> We need AI, obviously, for monitoring the state of the environment, um, but we also need um, data, you know, to model. Um, predict predictive modeling is a great way of also involving citizens because you can show to them what happens if. And you can set up a model that uh, lets everyone experience almost because people can see it you know if you behave in a certain way uh, this will happen it will have these positive and these negative consequences and if we behave in a slightly different ways it will have this and that so i think it would be a great both didactic but also participatory device to involve um, a citizen especially in the field of the environment to use AI for predictive modeling. So we have a question that relates more to uh, policy and regulation. And do you worry that policymakers are too eager to promote AI without taking a step back and asking whether AI is actually necessary or desirable for a particular application or solution to a problem? <clears throat> I think <clears throat> this is this is difficult because of the you know, the sweeping um, coverage of AI everywhere. And, um, <clears throat> you know, in, in businesses, um, now even small and medium-sized companies, you know, here every day you have to uh, <clears throat> adopt um, a digital strategy. You are small, but nevertheless. So, you know, do you need it or not? At one point, the question cannot even be posed anymore. The question is, which AI and for what purpose? And here again, the critical thinking comes in. Um, do, do you really need it? Um, but then what is the alternative? So you have almost a, a cost-benefit kind of calculation that you have to, to rise. And there it cannot only be the economic cost and economic benefits, but we have to widen our, our, our criteria, just as we do with the environment. You know? um, <clears throat> only <clears throat> two, three decades ago, it was only the economic criteria that were um, being applied. And now we have something that is called sustainability and we bring in more and more sustainable criteria. And we ask this as a matter of fact and something like this must also happen with AI. And uh, we change a little bit because we have another question here which is quite interesting. How do you imagine technology as AI will impact the cultural sphere? For example, in the use of <laughs> languages, English, uh, around the world to the detriment of perhaps other that are more local languages? Well, <clears throat> uh, languages is, is very interesting because um, <clears throat> speech uh, recognition and also uh, therefore translation is one area where AI is, is, is proceeding very fast. And <clears throat> Let me give you one example that I was uh, quite struck with. This was some time ago when I was in, in, in China, um, discussing also with people from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and I also spoke with some linguists. And they told me, um, <clears throat> now in China, if you want to study um, in the humanities, you also have to take um, informatics, computer science. You're interested in studying uh, <clears throat> Chinese history or whatever, or linguist, linguistics, but you have to take informatics. And the reason is that uh, the Chinese government wants uh, not only to uh, <clears throat> promote and to accelerate um, speech recognition, but also the translation of old Chinese texts, but it also wants to have historians 
who are able to help in this translation. And the prediction was that, you know, some years from now, the world will be inundated with um, the translation <clears throat> of ancient Chinese philosophical texts that the West never have, have heard about, or only very few specialists. And uh, <clears throat> that this will come um, as a kind of cultural um, advance of China in the world, also saying, well, you have your Plato, you have your Aristotle, but look what we have. We have all these uh, Chinese philosophers that ne one never heard of. So you can also use it in, in, in this sense. And <clears throat> I think what is important um, for in, in the cultural field uh, in, in general is it opens up also new uh, spaces of creativity. And <clears throat> I, I'm always surprised um, in, in cultural events and festivals to see how creative artists are with using um, uh, AI. In my book, I quote one, uh, one, one example of an artist that was using birdsong uh, <clears throat> that has been registered um, <clears throat> at, at a time when birds still had a richer, so to speak, vocabulary, a repertoire of the bird song. And this is declining also. It's part of the degradation of our natural environment. So th these birds today have a uh, more narrow repertoire than before. And so the artist used the bird song that she found in an archive uh, from uh, going back uh, some, some decades to teach the birds today to enrich their repertoire. So, you know, it's a, it's a brilliant idea, you know, how you can teach birds. <laughs> it's like a language community going in and saying, look, you're, if, if you continue like this, eventually your language, your culture will disappear, but we can help you. And it, it always needs initiatives. It needs people who become active, who want to save the world or a language or a culture. Then I'm going to turn to a little bit more technical, perhaps, question, which is uh, from Jose Fernandez. He asks, the AI Act describes the list of techniques and approaches, and all of them seem to be top-down, non-adaptable techniques that are completely unsuitable uh, to cope with dynamic and adaptable problems, like the one we have in modeling cities, for example. And they disregard more complexity-based algorithms. And do you think these algorithms should be included in the wide AI definition that is so much thought for? Well, <clears throat> I'm not that familiar with this uh, specific um, technicality, but in general, it's realized that um, the AI community wants to make algorithms more um, adaptable in a dynamic and complex world. Um, <clears throat> whether they should be included, I mean, if you see that something uh, works to the detriment of the purpose you want to have and you want to come up with good solutions for uh, urban design, for instance, that, you know, takes more variables into account, uh, et cetera, you, are, you have to start looking for the kind of technical solutions that you will need. And I think this is how technology always has uh, proceeded. Sometimes you end up in a, in a dead end, um, <clears throat> but very often, you know, technologies improve because you discover uh, by implementing them in the real world, you have uh, to take into account the dynamics of, and this always means complexity. I hope I've answered the question halfway. And I have another question here, which is also rather long. So I'm just going to see if I can shorten it a little bit. It relates to the fact that in this digital fair, sphere, there's, of course, um, it translates also into uh, inequalities between uh, people. And how do you see the future for this? Do you think it's going to enhance this? How do we make sure that everyone um, is, is kind of getting along equally on this uh, digital future that we're heading towards and that we're already in? Well, I think the, the, the pandemic has shown that we are very close to um, 
really deepening the digital divide in an irreversible way. Uh, we have seen that uh, when schools were closed during the pandemic, the children of parents who had enough um, you know, facilities at home um, <clears throat> who could help their children coped extremely well and even enhanced um, the possibilities of, uh, of, of children who were curious because they discovered there's a digital world of knowledge outside uh, what the school and their teachers could teach them. So it was great for some of these kids. But then there was the vast majority of kids who had uh, crowded uh, conditions at home, um, the, the, the mother and, and, and the siblings, you know, having to share the, the one computer that <clears throat> existed, et cetera, who had no help whatsoever. And this, of course, is something that we have to say is intolerable. We have to have a um, school system that is able to um, take all children's <clears throat> all, all children um, along, and uh, we have really to be very, very careful that the digital divide is not further deepened, because it means um, these people will have no chance in the in, in the labor market whatsoever. And um, we know very little what the labor market of the future will be like, actually, because it's um, those that are already very badly off, but it's also middle class uh, people that will lose their jobs and new jobs will not be created sufficiently fast. So there are huge problems there. And what we have to do now is to start with, um, with the children. Thank you so much. I can see that we have actually run out of time, even if we didn't make all questions. And I had many questions myself, but it has to be for another time. So I will give the word again to Angela. Thank you, Anne. And uh, what we can do is that we will copy paste uh, the questions that are in the chat and send them to Helga so you can <laughs> think about them more calmly later on. And in this way, also all participants know that uh, you know the questions are conveyed even if we didn't have time. Uh, actually, uh, I think in conclusion, we can only thank you, Helga, a lot for uh, generously sharing with us your analysis and findings. And maybe I have a little uh, question for you. I mean, a message from you to, to us in ERC and the use of artificial intelligence. Well, you know, actually artificial intelligence can be applied to everything, even to evaluation or scientific monitoring of research. We actually use uh, a little bit of artificial intelligence, uh, for example, mm -hmm. to identify yeah. experts linking with publications and so on, but we still rely very much on human beings yeah. be there to evaluate other human beings. So. Yeah. What do you think about that? Uh, and what would be your best wishes to ERC? Should we become, a, should we become a, a fully artificial intelligence-led organization or should we remain primarily human, if I might summarize very simplistically well, <laughs> our job? Well, um, I think um, you can use AI to standardize a certain routine procedures. I don't know whether you have followed um, the, the Swiss National Fund has set up this uh, CV harmonization group, which uh, you know deserves to be looked in because then you can make this an interoperable document and, and, and so on. Um, you also have certainly followed what UCRI does in, 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 in the UK with including a narrative uh, in the CV, which is on the other opposite end, because you automate one thing and you introduce, you know, words and narratives in the other one. Now, what this means for me is, to, to get away from the too rigid system we have now, which at the ESC you always knew. But <clears throat> think very, um, very clearly, you know, what can be automated and where do you want to give room for also, you know, narratives that may help you 
to situate it better. And when it comes to evaluation itself, again, I think some parts can be automated. And in other parts, you need all the more um, the discussion of the evaluators. And I mean, we all had the same experience from, and <clears throat> you know, my generation of the ESC, we were actually sitting in and listening to the um, ongoing panel discussions. Um, <clears throat> and I learned a lot about sitting in and listening. And what happens there, I think, is what happens still now is the panel rather quickly <clears throat> uh, reaches a consensus. These are the three or four top people. And these are the, <clears throat> I don't know, four people that are the worst, that have no chance. And then you, for the remainder of the time, you discuss those in the middle. So this is one way of you know moving on and discussing. I, I think the ESC has has gained a lot of experience how to do it and um, bringing this experience together. And again, um, it goes right across the panels, with one exception, as you know. These are the economists; they are the only ones that behave differently. But that's another story. All the other panels, you know, have similar mechanisms in, in evaluating. And to think, you know, what can we speed up by saying this is based on our experience, so we can jump here, we can jump there, but then the rest we have to discuss very thoroughly. Thank you, Helga. So, so <laughs> indeed, the artificial intelligence, yes, can can be a tool that we definitely started using and uh, as several other organization and will use uh, more. But yes, deliberation matters and the good news, all panels are having their differences and peculiarities, not only one, but I think that we are an old family of 27 panels now, no longer 25 <laughs> that are trying to, to find the balance between the general uh, evaluation criteria and of course the specificities of the various communities so I think we are going in a good direction and definitely yeah. we'll learn a lot from uh, from the use of uh, you know both human deliberation and uh, artificial intelligence that can let that can help certain uh, you know yeah. decision making <laughs> when there are certain parameters so thanks again if, if I may just, uh, Angela, just one, one more sentence, you know, um, my feeling was that uh, the ESC and in particular the, the executive agency, you have so much um, experience. You need time and a space to analyze work and utilize the experience you have. In other words, you have to do research on what you are doing. And this would be my plea to whoever, you know, is around, you know, give the ESC and the executive agency time and space to do the research on what you do. And this is the best way of answering these questions. Thank you, Helga. I think this is a very nice wish and uh, we shall see how and whether that will be implemented. Yes, uh, having I, I come and I, resources I, I, I for sign it. I come and I sign it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, Helga. And uh, thank you, Anne thank you. and Daniele and uh, Aris and Hilde and, uh, and Marcin who have been uh, preparing and that Barbara. with us and Barbara with you, absolutely. Thanks again, and I'm sure, Helga, there will be other opportunities of, uh, of uh, our paths uh, continuing to, to cross yeah. and, uh, and yeah. learn from each other. So yeah. thanks again, so, and uh, thanks to all everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. So,